Welcome to Christ the King Church, Shelby, North Carolina's Healing Center. Hi, I'm Melinda, Pastor Moore's daughter. Welcome to our broadcast. Relax and enjoy our teaching. Welcome to the School of the Bible. I'm Dr. Sam Parsons, and today we're going to be studying, continuing our study at the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 3. Before we get into it, let's take a moment, let's pray, and then we'll get right into the Word. Father, we thank you for your word, and as always, Lord, we ask you to open our spiritual eyes and ears. Help us, Lord, to dig into the word and to open ourselves up so that we can receive what you have for us from your word. Father, I ask you to open our spiritual eyes and ears so that we may receive the spiritual light that you have for us. Help us, Lord, now as we go into this study and we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We're going to read the first five verses, and then we'll do a little, little discussion about it, and then we'll continue on with our, with, our, with our discussion and as we go through this study. And so the first five verses, Ephesians 3, chapter one, uh, excuse me, verse 1, Ephesians 3, 1 says this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Go ahead and read verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. While Paul was in prison by the Romans, he was under house arrest. And in the day, he was free to move around the house with the supervision of soldiers. But every night, he was chained to a soldier to make sure he did not escape before his trial before Caesar. Yet, he didn't see himself as a prisoner to the Romans. He saw himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He knew that Jesus was the Lord of his life, not the Roman government. So if he's a prisoner, he was Jesus' prisoner. Now that's a good way to look at it. Jesus had him there for a purpose. He was under arrest and awaiting trial because he was a missionary to the Gentiles. That was the whole problem. He suffered for the very truth that he tried to explain to the Ephesians in this letter, and he did not make, it didn't make him back down one bit. No matter what they did to Paul, he was going to share this mystery that God had revealed to him, whether it meant imprisonment or death or whatever. He was not going to back down. Now, another thing we can say about this is that the last thing Paul wanted was for people to feel sorry for him because he was in prison. He wanted people to realize that it was a benefit for them that he was a prisoner. Now, stop and think about it. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And most of that was written while he was in prison. Just think of the fact that if he had not been in prison, he would have probably been so busy doing other things that he wouldn't have been able to do as much writing as he did. So God had a purpose for this imprisonment and it allowed him to have time to do all this writing and allowed us to have all the teachings that we do from Paul in what, what we consider the New Testament. So even when things look really bad, God has a purpose and we should stop and think about that on occasion. So there was a reason that he was there. Paul knew his call was to the Gentile world and he knew it was well known among Gentile Christians. Paul wanted them to know, look, I'm not making this up. It's a revelation that God's given to me. I'm only a messenger of this truth. And you know, it cost Paul a whole lot to hold on to this mystery. So he probably would not have made it up himself because if he'd only done a little bit of changing, he could have been free, but he wouldn't do it. God used Paul 
to declare specifically how Jews and Gentiles would be together, joined together to be one body, and that would be the body of Christ. This was something, something that had been hinted at by others, but it was really detailed through Paul's revelation. Paul trusted that his readers would understand what God revealed to him. And isn't it interesting that Paul, who describes himself as a, a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew among Hebrews, and goes through his entire list of qualifications that made him that way, would be used not necessarily to go out and reach the Jews, but to go out and reach the Gentiles. Isn't that amazing? But that's what God chose him to do. This nature of the union of Jews and Gentiles into this new body is the aspect that was not made known to other people. In the Old Testament, the salvation of Gentiles and the Messiah is prophesied, but the coming together of Jew and Gentile into the church is never spoken of. So that's the mystery that had been hidden, but was now revealed. And that's what Paul was doing here, was making that known and also helping it to come about. If we look at verse 6 and 7, which I read verse 6, but let's look at those two together. It says this, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So, this tells us what that mystery itself is, that believing Jews and believing Gentiles are joined together into one body of Christ, into one church, and they're no longer separated before God. You know, before the Jews were God's chosen people, Gentiles were left out, but now because of what Jesus did, all men were able to come in and be a part of this one body, this one new man, this one church. The truth, mean, this truth of this mystery means that Gentiles are now full partakers of the promise. This was a privilege that was no longer reserved strictly for the Jews. It was now available for the Gentiles as well. And this could only happen through the gospel where all men had the same standing before God through Jesus Christ. It's the same gospel that Paul is a servant of because of the grace given to him by the working of God's power. Now, I thought this was an interesting note. Paul says he's a minister, but that's a title of service and not, not exaltation. You know, today, too many preachers want to build themselves up as somebody big and special. But this word minister in classic literature of ancient Greece, that word, diakonos, means a table waiter who is always at the bidding of his customers. So a minister is a servant, a true servant, who's there to wait on other people. And Paul viewed himself as a minister of God, but a minister to the people. He was there to serve them and to help them learn this mystery and be drawn together as part of what God was doing, bringing people together into this one new body called the church. Let's look at verses 8 and 9. It says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Paul was amazed. You remember, Paul was going about and persecuting the church. Yet God chose him to be the one who would 
be one of the pillars of Christianity and of the church. And he was amazed by the grace of God that was given to him that he was called to preach the gospel and make it a reality. When you think about his personal history, which I just mentioned, this calling was really a calling of grace. Who would have thought that somebody who persecuted the church, who may have actually killed Christians and certainly had helped to imprison them, God could have had the grace upon him to call him, to pick him, to choose and to use him to help establish the very thing he persecuted and cause it to be the great religion or the great, I don't like even use the word religion, but the great belief system that it is today. That Greek word that's translated preach really means to announce good news. That's where we talk about preaching is announcing good news. Paul's preaching was simply the announcement of the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So the mystery is like great riches for the Gentiles. They can now come before God in a standing they could only dream of before. You know, in the past, if they really wanted to know the God of the Jews, they had to become Jews. They had to go through all the initiation rites. Everything, they had to become a Jew. But now, God's made a way through Jesus that they didn't have to become Jews. They were being accepted as they were, as Gentiles. But it was a complete change, not of them in other ways, but in their hearts. They didn't have to become a Jew in all the other ways, but they became a new person with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and they were one now in standing with the Jews who believed in Jesus. The believing Jews, the believing Gentiles were all, all one <coughs> Excuse me, in the eyes of God. Paul's passion was to make this gospel known because he felt like he'd been entrusted with really great riches, and he wanted to make it known to all people he wanted everybody to see and share in the fellowship of this mystery. It's a mystery precisely because it was unknown and unknowable until God revealed it. We should carefully consider what this phrase means. It demonstrates that there are not only facts to know, but also a life to live. United in Jesus with other believers without any separation such as existed between Jews and Gentiles. Boy, that's a powerful truth. The fellowship of the mystery was hidden before time but it was revealed after Jesus finished his work here on earth, on the cross. There's something truly new in the new covenant. It's wrong to consider Israel simply the Old Testament church and the church the New Testament Israel. Something brand new is taking place. If we believe in Jesus, we're all together one new thing. In verses 10 through 12, let's look at those quickly. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the church, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in which we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Now, we know and we believe that God's a being of infinite wisdom and glory, and he wants his creature, creatures, us, to know his great and manifold wisdom. And one of his purposes in his great plan of the ages is to reveal his wisdom and to let us know what he's doing. Understanding the character of God, it's not so that this can be not for a selfish or self-glorifying motive. In the way we think of a proud man wanting to show off and say, look at my brains and all my accomplishments and everything that I've done. God does this for the glory of his creatures, to say, I'm thinking of you. I'm wanting to show you this because I want you to benefit from it because the glory of the creatures connected directly to the glory of the creator. And that word manifold is a powerful word in the Greek. It has the idea of intricacy, complexity, and great beauty. 
So that manifold wisdom is intricate, complex, and great beauty in all of his wisdom. God wanted and had to make it known to us, but it was a particular time, and it was after the completion of the work of Jesus. He wants to know, wanted to let this wisdom be made known to the church. He revealed it by his work in the church, and he also reveals it to angelic beings when it talks about principalities and powers. God wants to reveal this wisdom to the church, but in the big picture, he wants to use his he wants to reveal this wisdom to the saints. And then they, through the saints, he's actually revealing his wisdom through the angelic beings. We're called for something greater than our own individual salvation and sanctification. We're called to be the means by which God teaches the universe a lesson and a beautiful lesson. It's amazing that angelic beings are interested in what's going on with us. They're being instructed by how we respond to what God does for us. And sometimes I imagine they look at us and think, boy, you guys are just failing really big time. And then other times they like, well, boy, God must really love them because of all the things he's doing for them. There's a phrase in what I just read that says, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished, as far as God's concerned, as, Paul, as far as Paul could, could determine, it says that everything was truly accomplished in the eyes of God. It's already done. Now, we're seeing it unfold, but it's already been completed. In God's eyes, it's already been done. It's already a finished work. Bringing the Jews and the Gentiles together into this one body has already been completed. We have, as Gentiles, the same boldness, access, and confidence before God. And we can come before God through faith in Jesus to God and not have to worry about our background or anything else because of who we are now in Christ through faith. Now, in verse 13, Paul makes a statement where he says, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul didn't want people to lose heart. He didn't want him to be discouraged because of the things that he was going through. He was afraid that they were going to look and see that all these bad things were happening to him, that he was in jail. But, you know, he could have never, as I mentioned earlier, have been able to write all that he did if he'd not been in prison. He would have been too busy traveling around. Paul would not have even had to go before Caesar if he hadn't invoked his right as a Roman citizen to appear before Caesar. But God wanted all the Gentiles to share in the good news of the Messiah, and he wasn't afraid to preach to them, even if that meant appearing before Caesar himself and at least allowing Caesar and all of his court to hear the good news of Jesus, which Paul had the opportunity to preach to him before he met his final end. God had a plan for him, and in the same way all of us have a, have, have a part, God has a part for us in his eternal plan, just like Paul did. If we know this, and we're working towards it, it's a great guard against losing heart in the midst of problems and tribulations which we all are going to face. Now in verses 14 and 15, Paul is beginning to pray now for the Ephesian church, and he says this, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. This is, the, this is the, another wonderful prayer that he prays. And what he's doing is, he's saying, 
I want you to know the knowledge of God's purpose. I want you to know God's will. You know, we can't play, pray effectively if we don't have insight to God's purpose and will. By saying, I bow my knees, he was taking a course that most Jews did. Most Jews would pray standing with their hands lifted up, which is not a bad thing to do. Our way we, the way that we pray doesn't always mean a whole lot, but he was trying to say, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm humble as I possibly can be. And that was a show of humility to bow down on your knees and pray. And when he thought about God's plan for him, he was humbled that God would choose him and use him in that way, in that, in that particular way, after all he had done and all he'd been through. So he's praying to the Father, and he's remembering that all God's family is called after his name. There is Again, this essential idea of the unity of the whole family of God, whether Jews, whether Gentiles, whether on earth or whether in heaven, they're all, to get all together. And then he prays this wonderful prayer that says that he would grant you, verse 16, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul is saying that we'd be strengthened with might in our inner man according to the riches of his glory, which is a generous measure. He prayed that that strength would come through the Holy Spirit and it would put how if we put into our inner man? You know, there's an inner man each one of us has that's as real as our physical body. We all understand the importance of strength in our physical body, but sometimes we don't stop and think about the fact that our, our inner man really needs strength, and sometimes we're very weak in our inner man. That's a problem. Paul asked that Jesus would live in, our, in the believers, and he says... He wants to dwell in us. In the ancient Greek, there's two ancient Greek words that convey the idea to live in. One has the idea of living in a place as a stranger, and the other has the idea of settling down in a place to make it your permanent home. The particular word here that's used this dwell is the ancient Greek word for a permanent home. In other words, Jesus wants to settle down in your heart, not just visit as a stranger. So we need spiritual strength to let Christ dwell within us because, you know, there's something within us that wants to in resist the influence of the indwelling presence of Jesus. That something can be conquered by the Spirit of God which gives us that victory of faith. But it, it's, a, it's a work. It's something that we have to work on. Paul wanted us to be rooted and grounded in love, which means we're rooted like a tree. We're grounded like a foundation of a building so that we can't be moved. And we're grounded in our love for God and know that he has love for us. Here again, he talks about maybe able to comprehend with all the saints. He wants us to know that we have to be in unity together, all of us together. And then he talks about something. I could go on for a long time. I'm going to try to be brief. I've only got a few minutes left. But he says, what's the width and length and depth and height of the love of God? And I'm just going to use these few descriptions real quickly. God's love is wide enough to include every person. It's long enough to last through all eternity. It's deep enough to reach the worst sinner and it's high enough to take us to heaven. Paul said that the love of Christ is something we can know. This isn't speculation, guesswork, emotions, or feeling. It's something that we can know. And then Paul asked that we be filled with all the fullness of God. 
boy. We can experience life in Jesus Christ to the fullness and to be filled to their capacity with Jesus even as God is filled to his own capacity with his own character and attributes. Boy, he, he really wants us to be filled up and know everything about God the Father. And then he ends with this doxology. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Can you just stop and think about it? He says, how in the world, how much is that? How can he do exceedingly abundantly of all that we ask or think? Think about this. You can ask for every good thing you've ever experienced and God can do above that. You can think or imagine things beyond your experience and God can do above that. You can imagine good things that are beyond your ability to name and God can do above that. God's able to do this in our life now, not beginning with heaven. This power works in us now. All these things, the spiritual strength, the indwelling Jesus, the experiential knowledge of God's love and the fullness of God belong to us as children of God. They've got to be received by believing prayer and can be furthered in our lives by prayers by, of others by our prayers for them. When the church, I like this verse, this, this statement. When the church understands and walks in God's eternal purpose, God will be glorified and the church will fulfill its important duty of simply glorifying God. We don't understand and walk in God's eternal purpose most of the time. And when we understand that, we'll be doing what God's really called us to do. Well, I pray that this has been a blessing to you. And I pray that you will dwell on this and think about all the big things I've talked about today, that God really loves you, God cares for you. And until next time, may God richly bless you. Amen. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, our website, our Lord is building his kingdom. Join us in helping our Lord harvesting souls for his kingdom. Thank you for watching Christ the King Church, Shelby, North Carolina's Healing Center. Visit our website, www.christthekingshelby.org and check us out on Facebook and YouTube.